And so tonight is butterfly night, if you couldn't tell. And so what we're asking is how do we launch through these times? And what I hope we could do is create a Kihila Kadosha, a holy community, and move from this random constellation of humans into something that is truly a holy community. So let's take a moment to say hello to others. And then in a moment, I'm going to introduce our very special guest and let's share. Like, what did we do during COVID times? How, what is our comfort level at this table of strangers? Um, and whatever else we need to know, a little Jewish geography, and just know, I know it's an occupational hazard by letting you all just talk to one another, but it's really necessary because we've just been alone for so long. So let's meet a stranger, okay? Shabbat shalom. I'll be back in a little bit. Um, if you can open your homage to the area that I put it at, it's Parshat Shalach, as you're opening it, I'm just going to say, Baruch Atah Adonai, Lohinu Melchalam, Asher Kachanu Vitzitah Vitzivan, La Sopa Divrei Torah, boom, right? The idea we're going to get busy with Torah. And so you don't think that I'm asking you to like do like deep Torah learning. I invite you to open to that Parsha because it's the Parsha, it's the Torah portion of the spies, the Meraglim. And they went out into the land of the Philistines which was Canaan, that they were told by God was going to be given to them. And they went into the land. And what did they see when they went in? Remember, they were led by Joshua. What they saw giants, right? They saw giants. And how'd they come back to report? They said, dude, we can't conquer these people. They're huge. And we're small. And they had these really kind of narrow minds where they didn't have the vision of what they were capable of. But two of them reported differently. Does anyone remember who they were? Joshua. And this is significant. It's Yehoshua and Caleb. Now, what do we know about Caleb? It means dog in Hebrew. So it was really Yehoshua, which means savior, and dog. So basically, the dog saved the day again, coming wagging his tail back from Israel saying, dudes, we could do this. We could totally do this. I know we can. And what happened to those two? They were rewarded. And they were the only ones that were allowed to enter into the land. But everyone else, what happened to everyone else? No one knows. I usually throw a county at this. They what? They were told that they would die in the wilderness and they would wander for 40 years, right? And then when the book of Deuteronomy is over, you turn the page and it's Joshua and he led them through Jericho. So indeed he was allowed to be redeemed. But what's the point of this? Denise is gonna talk. She's gonna talk and introduce us, right? It is. She's gonna introduce us. She's gonna introduce us to a reframing of what we're going through right now based on a very personal experience of what she went through. And a part of why I introduce it with this Torah portion, and I, and I offer the Chomashim that are on the table for you to look through as she's talking and just kind of go into dreamscape about what's happening there, is that most people forget that the Israelites had just come out of Egypt like a really short while ago. We're talking under a year. They were just in the desert for a teeny, teeny little bit of time. They still had slave mentality. And a part of what I love that Mordecai Kaplan always says about God is God is the power that causes for redemption in this world. So there's something about this idea of opening ourselves to the potential of the idea behind it is that we have been in exile. We have been just like a short frame away, just a year outside of when this whole thing started. And here we are now, right? Here we are now deciding what's going to happen when we enter the land again. And it's for us to define, how are we going to enter the land? Are we going to enter it like we can do this? Are we going to enter it with fear? We determine, we define our behaviors. It's like man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's not what happens to us. It's how we frame what happens to us. And that's why Denise Berger is here tonight. So I'm going to tell you about Denise Berger and then she's going to start because I know we're all like, so curious. So Denise is the reason why Open Temple exists. And I'm not saying that euphemistically. She is literally the reason why Open Temple exists. I was fabulously fired from a job in the South Bay. It was great. I was fired. It was amazing. And Denise called me up and she's like, oh, but I wanted you to bar mitzvah my son. 
And so I said, I'd love to do that. I remember Max with the puppet. He was a great kid. So she formed a group and there were like three other families and one of them was a lawyer. And he said, Hillel Cohen, you know, if I make you a nonprofit, every check we write you is tax deductible. And I said, awesome. What do you want to call it? He asked. And I said, make it open temple. So it literally was her faded phone call. But what happened was really a soul journey because I noticed that in the side room after I would teach every week, Denise was hard at work on her doctorate. Her doctorate focused, I asked her what it was, on corporate responsibility. And I had no idea what that meant. I was fascinated. And from that moment on, however many years ago, like 10 or 15 years ago, she has been a mentor and a teacher of leadership to hundreds, if not thousands of young people, including myself, teaching us what leadership really is. And so much of her journey began with something that happened to her that she's gonna share with us today on September 11th, 2001, when she woke up and went to work. The other side of that story is um, that I had gotten my nose pierced and my husband wasn't too happy. And one day Rabbi Lori comes into our house and says, oh my God, how cool is your wife? She, can you hear me now? So she said, how cool is your wife? She's getting her doctorate and she got her nose pierced. And I'm like, bam, my husband didn't complain about the nose piercing because it was blessed by the rabbi. <laughs> Kosher. Nose piercings are kosher, by the way. An ear is a kosher piercing and a nose ring is a kosher piercing. In case you want to know. <laughs> so on September 10th, uh, my husband brought our then 15-month-old son to my office, which was on the 103rd floor of the World Trade Center 2. And he peered out the windows, right up against the windows and looked out at this vast landscape that you, made you feel like you were in a helicopter. And I had trinkets on my desk and I had this little car that a client had given to me and my son, my son's first word was car. So he <laughs> instantly gravitated to it and wanted to take it home. And I let him do that. And this is the only thing that has survived. And so it, I showed it to him today because of course he didn't remember. Um, and then the next day I got up to go to a meeting earlier than um, I normally would go to work. We had people in from out of town. It was a national meeting of, of the department that I was a part of. And, um, and we sat down to have this meeting at about Oh gosh, I can't remember the time, 8, 8.30. And I remember, this is now 9-11, how distinctly beautiful the day was. The sun was sparkling on the buildings and it was like the perfect temperature, uh, breeze in the air, um, a, a, a a moment in time that I've only experienced one other time in, in New York since actually. I mean, it was just the variables were perfect. And so, um, so I went to this meeting. So I'm gonna tell you my story from this meeting on about how I experienced 9-11. Um, we were uh, just, you know, participating in conversation before the meeting starts. And I was one of the three people facing the window in this conference room. So we were on the um, 103rd floor and um, all of a sudden I see in my vision, this plane in the sky. And I'm not joking when I say this, but it is a little comical that the first thing that came to mind was the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie where he picks up his daughter in an airplane from a building. Com is it Commando? No, oh, or is it, 
uh, true recall or something? Total recall. Total recall. No, true, true lies. lies. True lies. True lies. That's the one. True lies. And I was like, oh, oh. And time slows down because I'm sure that all of this happened in the nanosecond. But to me, it was like a long time where I was like, that's a plane in the sky. This is like a movie I've seen. Oh, but wait, it's not a movie that I've seen. This is a plane. Oh, it's out of control. Now this is all happening at eye level as it's approaching the buildings. And I'm like, this is not, this is gonna, this isn't a plane out of control. I, I could, I could tell, like I knew, like I knew how to fly a plane. I can tell that the pilot is out of control and trying to steer away from the buildings because they had started to bank. I know nothing about flying a plane. Um, and, and in that moment, I thought, oh my gosh, that plane is going to hit that building. No, it's going to miss that building and it's going to hit this building. No, it's going to hit that building. No, it's going to hit this building. No, it's going to miss the buildings. And of course, it impacted the building in front of me right before my eyes. Um, and the, the most amazing thing happened because I thought the plane was gonna shoot out the other end, the building completely engulfed the plane. Nothing came out, no engine, no wing, nothing. And you could hear, I could hear, again, because time and, and all your senses slow down. I could hear the crunching of the metal as the plane was, was going into it. Um, and I don't remember the sound of the explosion because I think my visual sensories were overloaded. Um, so at that point, I looked over at my colleagues and, and the people not facing the window were like, what just happened? You guys all, the three of you went white. And, um, and obviously they heard the explosion, turned around. And I said, we got to get out. We got to go down to the lobby. Um, and so I turn around to leave and I turn back around to see, make sure everyone's following me. And they're not, they're like kind of gawking at the window. Now you can smell the gas in the air. And so I said, no guys, we got to just get down to the lobby. Like you need to get down to the lobby. And as I was passing people, I was like, get down to the lobby. I did not stop to grab my stuff. Um, and I, in my head was like, I am not stopping to wait for anything. There was an elevator and the doors had just closed. So I'm like, I'm going to walk down. I'm going to walk 25 flights down to the express lobby. Now, if any of you have been in the world trade center, the 78th floor was known as a sky lobby where you got on these massive elevators to the ground. So at that point in the 78th floor, people were very orderly. I have to say, no one was like panicking. There was no chaos. Um, everyone was just very quiet and methodical about getting down the stairs, which was very impressive. Um, and when we got to the 78th floor, my boss who was in the meeting with me said, hey, one of my bosses, cause I'll get to the uh, another boss in a second. Um, hey, um, let's let's jump on the elevator. And my head, so again, in my head, the I'm I'm processing a lot. And I thought, well, in an emergency, you're not supposed to get on the elevator because I'm one of the geeks that go when when there's a like a, a fire drill or something and you have to go and like half the half the employees stay back and don't participate. I'm the half that does participate. <laughs> so like, okay, technically in a in an emergency, the uh, you know, you're not supposed to jump on an elevator, but my building doesn't have the emergency. It's the other building. So I said, if there's an elevator there, I'm taking it. If not, I'm going to keep walking. There was an elevator. It wasn't crowded yet. We got on effortlessly and you could hear a pin drop the entire way down to the lobby. And then there were people there ushering us out of the building. And all I remember when I came out of the building was paper. There was paper everywhere. It was snowing paper. If you remember back 20 years ago, most organizations 
filed paper. They didn't have electronic files. And so I just remember thinking, oh my God, all the time that I have spent bugging my staff to file their papers and measuring them on filing their papers and being organized with their papers and all the paper is gone. And I thought, isn't that wild? So that is, so at that point I proceeded to walk and my whole mission was to get as far away from the buildings as possible. I wasn't gonna stop for anything again. And uh, I was about a block away and I heard the, the explosion from the second plane hitting my tower. But because I wasn't facing it, and this is also what your mind does, like we, we make these drastic assumptions. I made the assumption because it was in my head that, oh, that first plane must have exploded even more and the explosion leapt over into my building and that's what just happened. It wasn't a second plane. I was in denial that it was a second plane because in my head, I thought the first plane was just out of control. I didn't think it was terrorism. And I also didn't think that nobody got out of, that people didn't get out of my building. I thought if, people, if I got out of the building, then I'm sure everyone got out. Um, and so I had, I had made all these gross assumptions, um, but nevertheless, um, we, you know, the, the second plane explosion shocked us. We started to run down the street away from it. And later on, I found out that my husband, Eric, who also worked downtown, was coming up the subway steps as I was running right by them down the street. Um, and then he went into his office to wait for a phone call from me. But in my head, I was thinking, you know what, it's better for him to find out later that I'm okay and stress now than for me to stop and, and potentially risk my life. So, um, and also I had something else going on. I was pregnant with my daughter. So, and I was only about six or seven weeks pregnant. Um, and so I had to tell someone, a colleague that I was also running with, I can't run anymore. <laughs> like I can't, like I'm dying here. Um, and um, so we stopped, but little by little we made our way. I had nothing on me. I went, I finally got far enough away where um, I stopped in front of a deli and I asked them to use their phone and I had to get a little boss with them because they were like, well, do you have any money? Can, you know, like I'm going to pay them to use their phone. I'm like, do you see what's going on? I, like, give me the bleep phone. And so I called my mother-in-law in New Jersey because the other thing that was going on was that there were no cell, there was very little cell coverage. And I couldn't remember my husband's phone number in a pinch. And I didn't want to wait too long to try and remember it. So I called my mother-in-law in New Jersey to tell him to meet me at our old apartment um, on Houston Street. If you know New York City, Houston Street is kind of downtown-ish, but far enough away from the World Trade Center. So then I proceeded to go, still continue my way all the way to the East River up and into Chinatown. Whereas my husband left the office immediately and took the direct route to the apartment. Um, so actually he ended up arriving there before me. So that distressed him again, because he was like, well, where is she? Um, and, you know, to be honest, I think that in some ways he probably suffered more during that time period than I did because every step of the way I knew I was okay, but he had no idea where, where I was or what I was, what I was up to. Um, I did happen to stop at a clearing in Chinatown. And at that moment in time, there were a few of us stopped there watching what was going on. And at that moment, that very moment that I stopped is when my tower collapsed. And I thought, oh my gosh, I thought again about the material things because I just assumed that everyone got out. If I got out, everyone must have gotten out. And so I thought, oh, my pictures, they're all gone. And my wallet and my computer is gone. I mean, who cares, right? 
who cares? So, but that's where my mind went to for some odd reason. Made it to Houston, met up with my husband, um, and we went inside because our friends had been subrenting the apartment from us. And we started to piece things together. Um, we found out, in fact, that a good friend of ours from college was on the plane that took off from Boston and the plane that hit the tower that another good friend of ours was in and he died. And so there's a couple things that, that um, I reflect on a lot. And that is, um, it, it was either gonna be him or me. There was no scenario where Todd and I would both survive. Um, there is a scenario where we both died, but for sure, it was either going to be him or me. And so I'll talk about luck in a, in a minute, but, um, and, and that is a construct that has propelled me forward to, you know, make my life matter and, and mean something in, in the spirit of him and all those that did die. That day we lost um, about 200 people in our office, 50 of whom I worked very closely with. And, um, and we ended up going to a lot of funerals until it got to be too much emotionally for, for, our, for us. Um, one of the people that we lost was my boss who um, was an exemplary leader and was responsible for um, being a mentor to me in so many ways. Um, and I do believe that you know, if he had lived, my trajectory would look different. Not that it's better or worse, but it would look different. Um, he had died because, and I was able to put this together afterwards, because he left the meeting that we were in together, walked around the floor and told people to go downstairs. He is credited for saving the lives of some people that were in an internal meeting and didn't have the benefit of seeing what I saw to know how bad it was. I, am, I feel lucky in a weird way that I saw how big this situation was with my own eyes and to know to respond quickly and to just get out. Um, but there's a couple people from my department that wouldn't have made it without him walking around. And I believe he was on his way down and he got caught in the plane hitting the second tower. Um, so afterwards, I kind of had to step into his shoes uh, abruptly. Um, the other boss was in Chicago. And so I had a matrix reporting to him, but the real group of New York was now under my care. And, um, and I had to first find everybody. Was everyone still alive? Um, I didn't know. And remember 20 years ago, okay, we had the internet. We did not have smartphones. Some people, I guess we had flip phones, we did because I remember my husband actually always complained that I never carried mine with me. So that was the era where you didn't have your phone attached to you like an appendage. Um, and so um, he, uh, I, had, I had to find everybody through the computer. I didn't have my laptop. It was the game of telephone to try and track everyone down. And my first thought was, I need, I need to pull this team together emotionally, and I need to offload all the work that is on our plates for clients. So thank God I, was, I have been a little forward thinking in my career. I was one of the first people to develop an electronic filing system. So in addition to everyone having to file papers, I developed what is now like, you know, commonplace, but then was not a system for organizing um, the most important documents online. And I shared that system across the offices that I was responsible for from the East, uh, along the East Coast. So from Boston to Miami. Um, and so with that, I was able to assign, I mean, I got everyone on the phone and I said, I'm going to sign clients to you all from Boston to Miami that are New York clients, call them, make sure they're okay, tell them you're handling their business until we get 
you know, our, our, we, till we get back up on our feet. And they did, I mean, this group came together magically and the other offices supported our endeavors to grieve and to find space to come together and to figure out what just happened um, and, and then to figure out how we move forward. Um, and that was like one of the best gifts of my life. Um, and I should probably write to them and tell them that. Um, so uh, from there, uh, we ended up going back into a temporary office. Actually, it was like a dot bomb office, you know? And, and so it was like really funky, like nobody was happy there. This is, I, I worked in insurance and risk management. I mean, we liked our mahogany desks and, you know, our, our structured offices. And this office was like orange and bright colors. I loved it. My group loved it because it was it was different. It was cheery. It was happy, and and I promoted that. Like I'm like, we need this like alternate space, you know, to go back to like the traditional office right now would feel stuck. And I noticed that a lot of departments were siloing away. I know that pass. Um, so a lot of departments were silo, siloing and, and people were going internal. Um, and I thought this is not, this is not healthy. So actually my company hired a psychologist to come in and do any kind of work that people wanted to do and nobody was using them. So I said, we're going to use them. We're going to have twice a week, a lunch session, mandatory, everybody come and we're going to group process this. Everyone can do their own healing on their own time, but as a group, we're going to process this. Um, and, and I think that was such a like acknowledgement to humanity, you know, that we're, that we're humans, we're not robots, like trying to get through this. And that was another like really great gift that we had as a group to heal. Um, and I think it brought us like closer together in, in a lot of ways. Um, we went on to thrive. We went on to um, be awarded like the best team. I don't know, maybe it was like a, a token, a trophy award too, but it also felt good. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, just like New York has come out of 9-11 and emerged and, and re-blossomed, so, so did we. Um, so what, what are some of the lessons that I learned? Well, I guess I should, should I say what, um, maybe I'll, 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 I'll start with the lessons and then I'll, I'll get through that. It'll come out what I ended up doing in my life. My boss, Chris, the one that died, uh, about a month before 9-11 was lamenting that he wasn't spending enough time with his family and um, that his travel schedule was really hectic, but it was going to end in October. And he was super excited. He had two young boys. And, um, and so my colleagues and I uh, made a vow to ourselves, to each other after 9-11, that in his name, we would never let work and life get out of balance. So off we go to the races in getting back up to speed and little by little work and balance got out of balance. Uh, and, and I like to actually call it work-life integration, especially now, now that everything's integrated, um, but it got out of balance and work was consuming and the politics were consuming. Um, and um, I said, you know, and at that point, my kids were like five and three. And I thought to myself, I really, I need to honor that balance. Like we all said we would, we need to honor that balance. Um, an opportunity came up for my husband to work in California. And the timing was appropriate for me to kind of take a step back without leaving the workforce entirely, but definitely taking a step back to focus on the kids. It was a very intentional decision. Um, and we moved to California. Um, and through a series of actions, 
in my part-time job, I realized, you know what, I should go back to school for my doctorate. Now, this is coming from someone who never thought she would step foot in a school after college ever again. And then I went to business school. And now I was looking at a doctorate. Don't ask me why. But anyway, the doctorate seemed so perfect. It was uh, in leadership. Um, it was uh, the, the people that ran it were focused on women's issues. And at the time I was focused on um, gender equity in the workforce. And, um, and there was international and my whole career had been spent in international. So um, I leapt into the doctorate um, and uh, got through that. That's during when I met Rabbi Lori, as she mentioned. Um, it was a doctorate in organizational leadership, but I focused on corporate social responsibility. And I focused on corporate social responsibility because I had worked in an industry that did anything but that. And when I went to India with my cohort, I met a woman who said, you know, corporate social responsibility is, plug your ears, kids, is like teenage sex. Everyone says they're doing it, but only half are doing it. And of the half, only half are doing it the right way. And I said, oh my gosh, that's perfect. I am going to find out what doing CSR the right way looks like. And that is what I did. So when I finished my doctorate, um, I was like, oh God, what, what do I do now? What do I do now? I don't know what to do. And I started to like work out a lot and uh, which was, it wasn't a bad thing at all, but I felt that work life balance getting out of balance again, the other way that I was not being stimulated. And I think that work life integration is about making sure that you're you know, your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul are constantly being checked for balance. Um, and so I was kind of losing the mind part of it. Sure, the body was doing great, but the, but the mind part of it was, was suffering a little bit. And so I really needed to like, you know, make some more meaning happen in my life. And so I started teaching at Pepperdine. I started consulting with, um, social entrepreneurs and nonprofits. Um, and then eventually, you know, also with Vanderbilt, I was teaching. So, um, so lesson, I guess, like kind of like reflection number one is work-life integration cuts both ways. And I think that we can see a lot of parallels um, to that after, you know, what we've been through the, in 2020 with the pandemic and emerging from it. First of all, the whole balance thing got out of balance in a big way during the pandemic as people struggled and tried to figure out the new norm on Zoom. Um, but now that we're coming out of it, um, my reflection is like, try, really, really be good to yourself. It is, um, It can be very intimidating if you come out too fast um, and sort of you know jump into all the activities that you previously did. Um, I've even found that myself that I've gotten a little overwhelmed and have had to scale back. Um, it's really important to take care of yourself. Increasingly, we're seeing wellness, the issue of wellness enter um, the work you know, the work landscape and that employers are recognizing that wellness matters and the pandemic really brought that to light. Um, so I'm hoping to see more of that enter the conversations and enter the benefits packages at, at companies um, because I think wellness is um, really critical to well-being, productivity, health, longevity, all those things. Um, and wellness comes again across a spectrum of, you know, heart, mind, body, and soul. So that was kind of like my lesson number one from uh, emerging from 9-11 and the pandemic. Um, lesson two is 
uh, an old is around an old Chinese proverb, um, luck plus preparedness and opportunity. Uh, luck equals preparedness plus opportunity. And so I was lucky, very lucky, and I think about this every day, that my plane, the plane that hit the second tower, took off second. It could have easily been the first plane that took off just by the schedule alone. So that was an opportunity that was given to me to do something hopefully meaningful with my life or strive to. Um, my mission now since, since getting my doctorate and also it's kind of always been there, but I've really like now like put a flag in the sand around it that it, it, I'm really designed to help people reach their full potential. Um, and, and so that's what I strive to do because I figure if I can help people reach their full potential, then, then I've made my life count for something. Um, and that opportunity meant something. Um, the preparedness part is, well, uh, first of all, I spent a career in risk management. So my head is always thinking about, um, you know, where can I mitigate risk? And when we went up to the World Trade Center, initially on up that high, it didn't feel natural to me. And I remember joking with my friends, I'm gonna buy a parachute and a buoy and make sure my scissors are handy so I can jump if I need to, land in the Hudson River and cut myself out of the parachute. And so my mind was thinking ahead, whether or not that was plausible or not is not the, more, not the message here. <laughs> the point is my head was thinking and my husband likes to say that I have the viewing habits of a teenage boy. Um, I love action adventure movies. Um, and so I'm always, I realize this now, actually, after 9-11, I did not realize this before 9-11, that I'm always putting myself in the shoes of the person that is, you know, the, the hero or the heroine. Um, and what would I do? What would I do? I'm constantly asking myself, what would I do? What, what, what would I do? And so hence why I'm wearing my, my <laughs> badass apocalypse shoes here today in case, you know, something happens, I'm ready. Um, so that's, that's a, I, I reflect a lot on that message on luck. Um, now, I'm not suggesting everyone needs to be a good risk manager, um, but I think what I'm suggesting is awareness. Um, that it's good to go through life trying to be aware of where you're at, where you've been, what's around you. Um, the skill of awareness, I think, helps to prepare you for whatever's ahead. Um, and then the third thing I wanna point out that I've learned is, again, pardon, pardon the French, is that, you know, shit still happens. Like just cause you've gone through something tragic or major or disastrous, doesn't mean that okay, you survived that and now everything should be great because like you check that box of, you know, you're the one who's survived that. Things still happen. You still have days that are bad. You still have um, moments of frustration or situations, um, struggles, worries. Um, and, and I think that's okay, because that's part of being human. I think if you try to erase all those, like I'm not supposed to have that. It's almost like the survivor guilt, right? We all might be having a little survivor guilt from COVID. And you might want to, you, you might think like, oh, I, I can't complain about this because I survived. I can't complain about this because, you know, I have a roof over my head. And appreciation is really important. Um, but also acknowledge that like life is complex and messy and, and it's okay to have bad days even after um, you know, something disastrous happens that makes you feel like you shouldn't be having any more bad days. Um, so I think the antidote to that is um, 
a lot of gratitude and grace. Um, and I always uh, tell my students, you know, when you lead with gratitude, you shift the orientation. So it's okay to have bad moments, but the second you think about something that you're grateful for, and everyone can come up with something that they're grateful for, even Viktor Frankl did, right? So um, it shifts it shifts the awareness. Um, and I think it's really important to always have that perspective. So that's my story. <laughs> And I think what I, I want to do yes. a little thing, so I don't yes. have to scream. Um, thank you so much, Denise, for just being radically authentic and the shining, shining light that you are. Uh, a part of what I was going to like try to talk with you right here, I'm trying to get a way that I can sure. see everyone. So um, come over uh, here. Oh, yeah. Maybe we'll do it like this. Oh, there we go. There we go. Great. Yeah. Uh, a part of what, as I'm listening to your story that I keep thinking about is how we're going through this transformative time in a way that it's indeterminate about when things are going to truly shift. Like I'm modeling not wearing my mask right now outdoors because a few weeks ago, the CDC told me I didn't need to anymore. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to be outdoors and I'm not going to wear a mask. So there, but has anything really changed? I don't know. And a part of work walking through this parallel to 20 years ago and the lessons that you were introduced prematurely to what perhaps all of us are getting right now in a different way is this indeterminate nature of life, of not really knowing what's gonna happen next. I mean, there was a lot of PTSD after 9-11 and my brother who worked downtown at the time had a terrible time with it. And my cousin who was a New York City firefighter, um, his wife said, all my friends are widows now. And I look to that time of how they were the first to, and you were the first to enter into the indeterminate temporal nature of America. And I think all of us over the past year have had a similar sort of, it's a terrible analogy, but like circumcision of the eyes, like the blinders were taken off. And we see just how incredibly fragile and precious community is how much we are all called towards exercising our resilience muscles and how we really don't know what's gonna happen next. We have no idea. And so what it does, like you said, what I love what you said, is how your, your team really rallied together. Like you came together and coalesced and fought it head on. And that's the courage that you shared with me as a teacher of mine. And what I was hoping that we could share with the community which is how do we come together as a community after having such an unprecedented experience and not just pull the masks off, but really pull the masks off, right? How do we pull the masks off of who we are? How do we come out like, if anyone likes H.G. Wells, like the Morlocks from the underworld, right? Like, uh, you know, and come into this world. Does anyone read sci-fi? Am I the only one? Okay. <laughs> I like sci-fi. Yeah, but there's this whole <laughs> emergent world that we get to define and we get to really sing out. All of the world is a very narrow bridge, but the essence is to have no fear.
is weird. Singing is weird. Having a body is weird. Like, you know, letting, I was saying to Joe Green, who does psychedelic research in, uh, in psilocybin, like, everyone wants to get weird now. So they're doing things like that. I'm just weird. Um, but I, I think that like, when we share our authentic stories, not in a dazzling way, but like in a, this is just how I experienced it way. When we bring a group of people together to say, hey, we've got some wine and kala, want to sit down and break some bread and kind of see how incredible this moment in time is. You know, I see you, your smile is beautiful. It's so great to be here with you. When we come out of this time, right, with the blinders off, it really is in the butterflies taking flight, the opportunity for us to reclaim the authenticity of who we are in essence. We get to define the world that's opening up again. That's why we're here tonight. That's what the butterflies taking flight are. How many of us were at the Seder call? Of us. Yeah, some of us. In the Seder call, I invited everyone to go on a, a three-hour tour where we walked around Venice. And at one point, uh, we crawled on the ground in a playful nature, listening to Free to Be You and Me, when we asked the story of the four children, the four sons in Passover. And that was the caterpillar experience. And then we went to um, the Hisha Amda, this idea that we were, we were threatened with uh, being destroyed as a people. And we went into cocoons. And we lay on the ground in a sound bath. And at that point, I was asking everyone to break free. And when they broke free, we had Bittersweet Symphony playing on our silent disco headphones. It was amazing. Boop, 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 boop. And everyone, I don't know if you really captured that, but those of you who are there, you relive that moment, right? And then from there, we eventually schlepped to the Venice Canals and everyone was given a tiny box. And in the box, they were told to open it and as this beautiful music played. And as they opened it, a hundred butterflies flew out. And that was the setup for the series that we went through. Cara Natterson, a beautiful pediatrician, led us in a discussion of vaccinations and vaccinating our kids. Um, Hope Edelman, an incredible, incredible grief specialist, led us in a butterfly series number two of the cocoon, stepping into grief, unresolved grief, how we kind of lay in the wreckage of what the world is now because it's complex out there guys shootings are up right people are scared you know so many things are going on but i don't rule by fear i rule by awe and curiosity and that's what tonight's about denise models and leadership and if you want to talk with her more she has a little bit of time before she has to leave but denise models and leadership really the curiosity of what it is to work with a team the curiosity of what it is to be with one another in community and so the blessing that I have right now is we're gonna do some grape juice or wine and kala and food and song. The blessing I have for us as community is to be curious and say again, I keep going to repeat it a third time. I see you, your smile's beautiful. I love you, how have you been? That's why we're here, that's my blessing. Let's light some Shabbos candles and get some food in our stomachs. Let's say a big thank you to Denise Berger. And um, I'm going to try and figure out how we can get some wine up here. Oh, we have a little. Okay, it's also Pride Shabbat, by the way. It's Pride Shabbat. How many Pride? Woo! Yeah. Um, so it's Pride Shabbat, so we're going to light some Shabbat candles. And we're going to be we're gonna be Pride Proud. And our friends at JQ International sent us a great Pride box, a Pride Shabbat in a box, with an awesome... We should actually, you know, I think I'm going to send this home with Denise, with an awesome Pride cookie. I mean, like, they thought of everything. Um, uh, so I'd like to invite everyone at their table to find the Shabbos candles. They're scattered about. I didn't know if you knew that you could eat during this. That's why the strawberries and the raspberries were there. You could just do like a simple brochatav and I and a and just enjoy it or not. Um, but we're going to go into, uh, into our food and song. All right. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to light some Shabbos candles. Is Cheryl Katsovitz here? Are you on a light with me? Okay, great. So we're going to light, and I see people coming. Come on, let's go to shop. And uh, then after the way this is going to work, we're going to do some kiddush. We're going to do some challah. I know some people brought some great wine. I'm going to ask those of you who brought wine to be our sommeliers and like allow everyone to experience them and create a tasty kitchen. 
And then we're gonna we're gonna cut up the challah and pass it around. And then we're gonna buy tables or areas and buy people in to get food. And as the food is happening, we're going to engage in song. How does that sound? We're all in? I'm just managing expectations. That's it. All right, good. I learned that in my leadership courses as well. All right, blessings here. Let's go. We start Shabbat in our family by saying what we're grateful for this week. So please um, open it up. What are you grateful for? What has happened in your life? I love you so much. What what gratitudes do we have? Please share them with our friends. Please go ahead. And then we're going to light the candle. Any gratitudes? I want to hear some gratitudes. I'm grateful for community. I'm grateful for your beautiful smiles. I'm grateful for humans. Anyone else? Palm trees. Palm trees. I'm grateful for palm trees. Summer. Summer. I am grateful for the imminence of summer. Yes. Medical science. Medical science. Oh, oh, I am so grateful for medical science. Thank you. The ocean. I am grateful. You know, why do we call it planet Earth? Shouldn't be called planet ocean? Think about it. Three quarters of it is ocean. All right. It also is flat. It's <laughs> I am I am grateful for flat earthers who remind me that I need to think about how I understand the origins of knowledge and what I know. Thank you. Grateful for any other gratitudes? I'm grateful for Cheryl. I am grateful for seeing your lipstick. I am grateful for seeing all of your lipstick that are wearing lipstick. And teeth. Jane's beautiful smile behind a mask all year. I am grateful for Jane, who is our amazing, amazing administrative guru here. Let's hear it for Jane, bring it all together today. Woo! I am grateful for Danya and Denise, who are on the board of Open Temple. Is someone else here? I don't know if I, if I just shut out another board member. I am grateful for those that has gotten us through this incredible time, these quarantine times, to come out emerging and thriving. All of this I am grateful for. I am on fire, and that fire is going to create a Shabbos candle right now. <laughs> I'm grateful for Pride. I'm grateful for JQ International. Hi. I'm grateful for the Or Haga News, the hidden light of Torah that's hidden inside of Torah and in all of us. I'm grateful for the sound, the rhythm, the heartbeat. So basically that's God saying, well, out of everything I created, Shabbat's the coolest, whatever that means. Baruch 
Thank you. 